So we've gone from, uh, from insects to fish to, uh, to humans and now finally to our future robot overlords. Uh, we'll be hearing from Radhika Nagpal. She is the uh, Fred Cavley Professor of Computer Science at Harvard and also a core faculty member at the WIS Institute for Bio-Inspired Engineering. Her research uh, is on engineering and understanding self-organizing collective systems, particularly uh, on the border of computer science and biology. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so just a sort of slight change of topic. Um, you know, so far all of the talks have been about understanding these canonical systems, fish, groups, um, insects, as these amazing systems of decentralized decision making. And by understanding them, by being able to model them theoretically, we can actually also use them as a way to build new systems. We're constantly engineers ourselves as groups. Uh, we try to create systems. And creating decentralized systems, large-scale systems that function well, is a really important problem. Um, not just in robotics, but if you think of the internet as an extremely large system, or you know, Google's networks of machines, we're constantly creating networks that are made of lots of individual pieces that have unreliable information, that have limited knowledge, and we want these systems to be fast, to make good decisions, and do things well. So I think there's a really tight um, relationship between understanding collective intelligence and trying to recreate it. And so that's what I was going to talk about today. Um, so I wanted to start with just two examples of collective intelligence that inspire my group and, and perhaps are a little different from the ones from before. So the one on the left is a starfish, and, and the one on the right, um, yes, you're right, uh, is a, a termite mound. And if you think of both these systems, they're incredible structures. They have all kinds of internal architecture. Um, they have reproduction centers. They have respiratory centers. They have metabolic centers. Um, and they're created by the decentralized actions of a very large number of individuals, whether it's identically programmed cells or identically behaving uh, individual termites that are much smaller in scale than the phenomena that, that they are creating. And it's really incredible to think about how these structures can be created. We've seen lots of examples where we think about decision making. We want everyone to make the same decision. Here, it's a slightly different kind of collective intelligence. We want everyone to make a different decision, but somehow all those decisions have to fit together, even though one individual may be on one end of the system and another individual might be on the other end. How do we all make decisions that, at the end, lead to a coherent global result? So I think this is fascinating, of course, to a biologist. You know, how, how does this occur? But it's also fascinating to a computer scientist, and, and the question would be, What's the program? And how would we write such programs, maybe not to recreate biology, but to recreate systems that we want? So of course, you know, I've only presented two, but there's just a huge number of examples to take inspiration from that can guide us in making different kinds of systems. And the motivation is really quite clear why we would want to build such kind of systems. So if you think of, there are just lots of settings where there's a reason to have large numbers of things. Maybe we want to distribute them over the environment. Um, maybe we want flexibility. Maybe we want to mass, mass manufacture them. Um, maybe we want to sense different points. So there's an inherent reason to make systems that are composed of large numbers of individuals. Um, there's redundancy. For example, if some of them get crushed or some of them are lost, um, there's parallelism. They can all work in parallel. So if you think from anything from agriculture to sensing, uh, to things like warehouses, we use large numbers of individuals. So if we do, if we're going to make this anyways, we want good strategies for programming them. And so understanding how to program systems in large groups that do well is something that I think we can really learn from biology. So in my group, um, we tend to focus on this question of, you know, how do, how do we think about limited individuals that are looking locally, making local decisions, uh, maybe not aware of the whole network, um, and make sure that they can actually achieve a global result that you want. And sort of looking at these two, two directions, um, both how do we take local rules and predict what would happen globally, and the inverse, could you tell me what you wanted globally, and maybe I could write a program that would automatically produce the ant program or the fish program that did what you wanted. And so that's where some of the theory comes in. So we look at this in a number of different ways. Um, 
We look at it purely uh, in theory, sort of what kinds of patterns and properties can we generate from artificial agents. Um, we also work with some biologists. Mostly I've worked on uh, multicellular systems, more recently social insects. Um, but a big part of uh, what I do is uh, build systems. And so I wanted to pick one particular one uh, to show you today, just to show sort of the relationship between you know, what ideas we have learned from studies of biology and what it means to actually try and translate them into an engineering system. So um, I'm going to pick one of my two favorites, uh, which is the termite mound. So as I said, the termite mound has a number of different architectural features. It's a functional structure. But what makes it so amazing is that by all accounts, it's produced by a decentralized group of individuals, up to a million individuals, that are participating in building the structure in different parts. And if you think about it, this decentralized part is really important because individuals might be really separated in very different locations in this structure. So if they all had to coordinate and talk to each other for every little decision they make, that would make the system pretty much come to a halt. Sort of like thinking, you know, how does a big group achieve anything? Well, if everyone, if there's only one leader and everyone has to talk to that one person, you know, you just have a big bottleneck. So clearly these systems have moved away from that bottleneck by having this sort of decentralized structure. Uh, and they achieve everything that you know, we would want to achieve. They achieve amazing parallelism. Uh, there's a robustness. Certainly, you know, taking a large number of termites out of the colony, as, as we have now done, you know, doesn't destroy the colony in any way. Um, and they achieve a complex result. So all of these are really interesting things that individuals do. Um, oh, I meant to actually show this video just to show sort of the individuals are sort of centimeter scale cooperating to build walls and structures around. But of course, there's many different parts of the mounds that individuals could be working on. So of course, we also build. And we like to build lots of different things. But if you could imagine that you know, at some point in the future, we could actually make robots that would do building for us, what would it look like to have uh, many different programmed individuals build things? Um, there are lots of settings where we send people to build things that maybe we would not like to send people to build to. There are lots of environments where we build things and we leave them because we don't you know, want to go and remove them. There are lots of places where a substitute for you know, sending humans in would be really great. Um, you could monitor and repair uh, and do many things if we could cross that line. Of course, it is very hard. Um, and one of, the one of the sort of questions, could we do it ideally in the way termites do it. So could I make a whole bunch of robots, throw them, you know, show them a picture, build me this, uh, throw them into the system, and then they exploit all the parallelism, all the robustness, uh, all the ability to function even if a few of them break, uh, but still achieve the right thing. And hopefully not build us a termite mound, because maybe that's not exactly what you want, but build us whatever that thing was that you did want. So we want the same properties, uh, but maybe we want to translate them to build an arbitrary structure. So I'm going to first sort of describe how, how we kind of uh, looked at this problem in a simplified abstract model um, and show that, in fact, in, in some cases, we can. We can actually say, here's a picture of what I want. Um, go build it and assume that these robots can do it. So the idea is imagine that you, had, you throw down a bunch of bricks and you throw down a bunch of robots and you show them a picture and you say, build me X. But the robots have very limited knowledge. They don't know how many other individuals are part of their colony. Um, maybe they're just there by themselves. Um, they can only sense maybe uh, a limited region around them. Uh, but they can certainly start to build. So maybe they can go up to a region, get some structure, get some material, come back, circle around, and try to find something to do. And what you care about is all of the individuals who are doing this somehow are able to coordinate, even if they don't run into each other, even if they don't know how many others are in the colony, and even if some of them get removed. So is it, is it possible to take very limited, simple individuals and figure out what's the coordination that allows them to build a particular structure? And hopefully, if you can do it for one structure, maybe we can generalize that to many structures. And that's sort of what we think of as a compiler that I put in you know, the structure that I want, and out pops out a program that makes it happen. So to do that, at least we can do that in some kinds of um, contexts, we can combine ideas from two areas. One of them is cellular automata, uh, and the other one is, is from social insects. I'll just show sort of the combination of those two. So the first 
way in which we thought about this problem was as tile self-assembly. So thinking this way goes back to the beginnings of computer science, Ulam and, and von Neumann, thinking about cellular automata and thinking about crystal growth. So imagine that you were a tile floating in space. Um, and you're floating in space, and you come up to a structure where you can see a few other tiles. Then as a tile, you get to make a decision. Do you attach or do you not attach? And these rules of attachment then result in many different kinds of structures. So what we need to do is design these rules of attachment. And ideally, what we'd like to prevent is bad things from happening, right? So I could have tiles that attach in areas that aren't the right place to attach to begin with. I could have tiles do all the right things, but then leave a gap that's unfillable and have a defect. So there are lots of ways in which independent tiles could cause problems. So there needs to be some sort of coordination. In our case, we have other problems like these where it's actually possible to put something in, but very, very difficult. And so we don't want to build robots that have to do really difficult tasks. So maybe there are lots of problems that we have to avoid through coordination. So we can do it two ways, um, by two means. The first one is by storing state. So many, um, there are many examples of doing this, for example, in DNA self-assembly, which also operates on tile self-assembly ideas. Uh, so imagine now that I had actually colors to these tiles. Then the tile itself encodes something about the global piece of information. So now, as a tile, you come up to a small section, you see a small section, and you can make a coherent decision about what to do. And then you change your own state, thereby influencing every other tile that comes in the future. And as long as um, we can somehow embody state in the tiles, we can do this. And in the worst case, every tile has a different state. That's sort of like saying I, I pixelated, I gave everything a pixel number. But there are actually ways, and lots of groups have shown you can dramatically reduce the amount of information needed. Okay. And the second piece is to look for uh, structural invariants, so things that lead to problems. Are there small, local, locally detectable um, ideas that could prevent you from in the future running into problems. So we found one that actually turns out to be pretty useful, which is that this idea that if you want to avoid defects, then you want to ever avoiding, you want to avoid building structures like these, where you leave a gap that has to be slowly filled. And so you always want to build in contiguous strips. So actually you can design local rules that try to maintain this idea of building in contiguous segments whenever you want to fill in things. So, there, so finding these, in, these invariants is also another way of um, being able to make decentralized systems coordinate. So when you combine these two, um, the basic sort of takeaway message is that actually we can create global to local compilers and for classes of shapes. So in this case, uh, any, any sort of arbitrary shape that doesn't have holes uh, would work with the rules that I've presented so far. Um, and the nice part is that it doesn't matter what order the tiles arrive in, we're sort of guaranteeing the end structure. And so if you've seen things uh, like DNA self-assembly, those are also kinds of rules that have these compilers where you can put in a shape and output rules for tiles that have to come together. Um, and there's lots of interesting questions here, like what happens if you break the shape apart? Could it repair itself? Um, can you do three-dimensional shapes? Can you do shapes that adapt to the environment? And so there's really big space where people are slowly filling in answers on how you can relate global to local. I'm losing track of time already. <laughs> OK, so the second piece. Um, OK. The second piece is adding the coordination. So um, I said that there were tiles floating around, but in reality, I have robots that move around materials. And the material doesn't really talk to other material, per se. And the material may not have state. So how do, how do termites deal with this, where individuals are editing things, but they might be very far away to pass information? And the really cool idea is that they pass information through the environment, um, which is often called stigmergy. So I can, I can look at the environment, but then I modify the environment, and then I leave. And then someone else comes along and notices that environment, and that influences what you will do. So a good example of the way we do it, for example, is putting street signs or putting office numbers. You walk through an environment by putting something, uh, something on a notice board, I've influenced some anonymous person who I didn't even know. But what was important is I influenced them at that location, at the location. So if the information is tied to locations rather than individuals, this is actually a really, really powerful way of communicating. So you can do two things. You can look at sort of local patterns 
Um, so for example, if I see a lot of columns, maybe I should build a roof. Um, you can also do it by pheromones, by actually leaving sort of this is a good site or this is a bad site or really building needs to happen here very quickly uh, information. We can translate this idea to robots as well. So robots can look at patterns. They can look at local block configurations. Uh, we can even do things like pheromones by, by augmenting the material that the robots are using. So imagine having RFID tags uh, in the material, then robots can actually deposit information in the structure themselves. So we can really come close to having Stigmergy uh, with robots. And in fact, it turns out that there's just a whole spectrum where you could have really smart environments and very dumb robots, or very dumb um, blocks and very smart robots. And we can think of how the information transfer that has to happen can actually change um, can be moved from the environment to an individual in almost a smooth kind of way. And it's really exciting that these sort of links many different things from DNA self-assembly to robots that build with blocks. So this is the sort of theory side, and this is just an example of um, several different simulations. Each of these simulations is built on a compiler. So you put in a picture, it outputs the local rules, and this is just showing some different kinds of structures uh, that we can prove things for. So in each case, the individuals are coming in different orders uh, in every run, and so the structure doesn't always form the same way, but you're sort of guaranteed that the rules will cause sort of no conflict. Of course, this isn't, there's still lots of questions like what happens when someone makes an error, and that's actually still hard uh, to compile against. Okay, so the second thing I wanted to show in my remaining time was to show um, how we translate this to a physical system. And that actually turns out to be quite a challenge as well. We really don't know how to build simple robots because, of course, termites are not simple either. Um, they're you know, tiny little individuals with incredible capabilities of locomotion, manipulation, and sensing. And so when we create a robot, we actually have to solve all of those. How do we have the amazing kind of locomotion or even a good locomotion how do we carry while locomoting on rough trains? How do we then climb over things we just built? Uh, and how do we sense these local configurations? All of those things that you know, nature gives us for free, a robot comes with nothing. And so all of those have to be built. So this is just some, um, I was going to say recent work, but actually we've been working on it for four years. So it's not really recent. It's four years. And we thought it would be two years, but... So, so the first thing is locomotion. So we built these robots that um, the strategy is they make stairs. They're good at climbing over stairs, and if they want to reach higher, they have to make themselves a stair. And by that strategy, they can make structures much larger than themselves. So they climb using these specialized wheels, uh, and this helps them very simply climb. Uh, they can sense um, where they are in a structure. So this one is using ultrasound to sort of circle around a structure, look for uh, a sort of in road, and then climb over the structure. And it uses these patterns uh, and a tilt sensor to sort of keep track of whether it's going up and down and how to get off and get around again. So this is an individual robot being able to locomote and navigate in its own structure. Uh, the next part is manipulate. So you have to pick up the material and place the material um, in some way. And so this is our simplified version of a, of a gripper. Um, it can basically lift blocks, but it sort of has a spring-loaded hand. So when I put down a block, my hand sort of automatically opens. So we're trying to keep these very simple so that we can make many of these robots, uh, and each one has very simple capabilities. So here it is, placing a, ro placing a block. It actually has a touch sensor, so it can sort of jiggle the block around until it feels like it's placed it well. Uh, the blocks themselves are kind of Lego-like, so just to help the robots build things and have, have the things self-align. So we can really co-design the robots and the materials that, that they use. So here's an example of, again, placing a block. Building the foundation turns out to be much worse than building on top of a structure because you kind of don't have as much information. So once we put it all together, we have an individual that has some decent capability. You know? So it can climb up structures, um, keep track of where it's climbing, decide uh, to place a block. I'm going to end with this video, so. <coughs> all right. So the last step in all of this is coordination, right? So now I have a single individual, and now I want to put many of them together. So this is sort of the last step. 
So each individual now comes to the structure and runs a very simple algorithm. It tries to uh, find a place to build. And when it builds, when it finds a place to build, it just continues. Um, let's see if. Uh, it finds a place to build and it starts to build. So here's just an example of a simulation of this idea. There's an individual, it starts to build, more individuals come along, but the individuals are actually unaware of others. They simply come and look at what's been built before and make decisions about what to do next. And the important thing is they have to follow rules that prevent them from building things they can't climb over. So I can't build cliffs by accident, I can't block off other robots by accident. So there's a lot of coordination in these rules. So everything looks kind of like different kinds of staircases uh, glommed together. Okay, so here's an individual robot actually running the rule, just to show an example of that. So we have the robot, it's building stuff, um, but every time it comes back to the structure, it really has no memory of what's happened before. So as you'll see in a moment, sometimes the structure destroys itself. <laughs> this is sort of like Stephen Pratt, you know, destroying the house of the, ro of the ant, so we just, we torture robots instead. Um, all right, but sometimes, you know, good things happen too, and you might have nest mates who come and build. And this is actually how the coordination survives, because if I don't keep too much information about the world, then I'm not over-obsessed with it becoming stale. In fact, every time I approach the world, it's a new world, because many of my nest mates may have done many things. And so eventually, we can put it all together, um, and have lots of robots cooperate. And the only information they're passing from each other is to stay away. So, you know, you don't want to sort of lay your brick on top of another robot or smash into it, and that's pretty much it. So it's sort of like stay away, stay away, stay away is the uh, only important message being sent between individuals. But we can make them make many different kinds of structures. All right, so um, just to wrap up, you know, obviously that's just one instantiation of the idea. There's so many interesting structures that animals build that we're not even close to. So how do we create systems that can solve these kinds of problems? What are the different kinds of robots we, created, we can create? So you know, my group is one of several gro groups that are thinking about different instantiations of these robots that could build together, but all of us have the same problem, which is we want to build lots of these robots that have simple capabilities that can then coordinate. And so that coordination is a key idea that we can perhaps learn um, from biology. Um, and just to uh, wrap up, this research is part of, is itself the product of collective intelligence. And so uh, Justin uh, is a longtime collaborator working on um, the abstract models. Kirsten is our amazing robotics designer, so very creative person. And uh, Niels Knopf, whose work I didn't get to show, but has built other versions of robots that built out of sandbags and foam, some more amorphous materials. Uh, and my amazing group that I get to work with. All right, thank you.